and good evening. Welcome you tonight back to our series on the revelation of Jesus Christ as we continue our study of Revelation, the 14th chapter. So far, we've taken a look at the first angel's message. Tonight, we're going to take a look at the second angel's message. And so those of you that are joining us by television, we welcome you. Glad that you've tuned in. Or if you're listening to the radio or watching it on the internet, we're just glad that you're tuning in, and we hope that uh, what we are studying together on the book of Revelation will bless you in a special way, because uh, there's no book in all the Bible that's important to the people that are living today as the book of Revelation. You need to understand the prophecies of Revelation to understand where we are and what's happening and where we're going. So uh, if you've been watching, following this series, uh, we hope it's blessed you. If you haven't, we hope you can go back and pick up some of the subjects and understand them and uh, have an opportunity to look at them. As I mentioned, this evening we're taking a look at the second angel's message. First angel declared to the whole world with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and the earth and the springs of water. That was the first angel's message. Uh, tonight, the second angel's message is a call about Babylon and its fall. That's what we'll be looking at tonight. Uh, we're going to have to go back and pick up some history so you'll understand what's involved in that fall. So we hope you can follow along. Our subject, our next presentation, is the third angel. There's three angels in Revelation 14. And the third angel has a special message, particularly for people right down at the end of time, that you and I understand clearly what the third angel message is about. And that's our next presentation. And we know that uh, if you understand it, it'll be a great, great blessing to you. So be sure and follow. Get your Bible. Get your Bible. Get you some pencil and paper and sit down and follow carefully as we go through this subject. I'm very happy tonight to continue to have with us the His Voice uh, Quartet. Uh, they have blessed my soul. Have you enjoyed them? I have very much, and they've been great. Tonight they're going to be singing a medley of What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and they will be accompanied at the piano by Janelle Dixon, and I know that you're going to enjoy this very, very much. I've heard them practice, and I think it's just a very, very beautiful song. But before they do, uh, Chuck Algar is going to come and read our scripture at this time. Good evening. Do you have your Bibles with you tonight? We're going to continue on with Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to read Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. So if you have your Bibles, let's read together. Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. The second angel's message. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. May God add his blessing to his word. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go. So true to me. 
have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every We come to you tonight to thank you for being our friend, our Savior, our Redeemer. Thank you, Lord, for all the things that you do for each one of us, and we pray, Lord, that our hearts tonight may be open that they may be soft. We pray that the Holy Spirit may be present and that we might be sensitive to your guidance and your leading, that as we study your word, that we may sense where we are, that we might know how to follow you. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. second angel's message, which as you have seen, it's very short. And one verse, all it is, but that verse is extremely important. And I saw another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this angel is declaring across the whole world, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and the reason is because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. A man by the name of Charles Dickens wrote a book entitled The Tale of Two Cities, which deals with the cities of Paris and London during the late 18 or the late 1700s. 
telling about the upheaval and all that was taking place in those two cities and what happened. When you pick up your Bible and you begin to read through it, particularly as you get into prophecy, you find a tale of two cities. And that tale of the two cities is a tale of Jerusalem and Babylon. Those two cities are contrasts over and over as you go through the Word of God. So much of the things that happened to Babylon, as you approach the end of time, the Apostle John pulls on that and makes this application that we're looking at tonight. So it becomes important that you and I go back and take a look at the history of Babylon, see what took place as we make the application to what is happening today when it refers to Babylon. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back, take a look, and see what it has to say about the fall of Babylon. The first record we have of Babylon is found in the book of Genesis. And in Genesis, the 10th chapter and verse 8, it says, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. So Cush gave birth to, to Nimrod, and Nimrod began to be a mighty individual on the earth. If you'd like to do some study in this area, particularly with ancient history, I would recommend that you go and read a book called The Two Babylons by Hislop. It'll give you a lot of the background of what's happened to here. But let's go on. It says, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So Nimrod, who was a mighty individual, was a mighty hunter before God. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Now this is the first reference we have to Babylon. Babel refers to Babylon of old in the land of Shinar and so forth. What happened here? Well, after the flood was over, and people began to live different places, uh, the animals were no longer tame. They became vicious. And many of these people feared for their lives because of the animals. And you can read in Scripture where God even said, I'll drive out the animals ahead of you because the animals were ferocious and, and all. And so the people were concerned about them. Any individual that became a great hunter was revered by the people. And they thought a lot of him because he protected their lives. And this is what he, he did. And therefore, Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter, began to be revered by the people. When he set up these cities that are mentioned here, and Babel or Babylon being one of them, for the first time they begin to build walls around the city for protection and so forth. And this is the reason the people begin to place him on a pedestal. And they begin to consider him more than human. In fact, because of his greatness, they begin to worship him as a god. And all. Begin to look upon him as more than human. Ancient history tells us that he married a woman by the name of Semiramis, and they begin to worship him, Nimrod, as the sun god. The sun god to them was the great, great god. You see, he was the god that always went forward, never went backwards. He was the god of conquest, and if you go different places, like if you go to Europe and so forth, Watch and you can see them, and you can see this man driving these horses in a chariot coming up, and that is this God that they worshiped as the sun God that always went forward, never went backwards. He was the God of conquest, and they worshiped Nimrod as this. They believed that his wife was a goddess, 
and they worshipped her as a goddess of fertility. This is how they looked upon him. In fact, when Nimrod died, she told the people that her husband had gone back to the sun, and there he was the god of sun, and they worshipped her as a goddess of fertility. So this is the beginning of the city of Babylon, and as you read through the scripture, you'll find that Babylon continually, over and over and over, worshipped the sun. It was their god. And you find that this was constantly a problem uh, that they had. So this is the beginning of Babylon. All right. Babylon as a city was built, was destroyed, and so forth. But when you come along to the time of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nebo Pelazar, uh, is the one who really began to make Babylon into the city that it became. He started it, but it was, ba- was Nebuchadnezzar who enriched it and made it the great city that was, built walls around it, and lavished it with all kinds of wealth. Nebuchadnezzar made the city of Babylon, and the people in the city of Babylon worshipped God, the God of the sun. Well, you remember Nebuchadnezzar came down and made a raid on Israel. You remember that? Carried off the people of Israel. And among those that he carried off were some young men. One by the name of Daniel. Now, folks, this is the beginning of God's effort over and over and over to get the city of Babylon to recognize him as God. And so you're going to see effort after effort made by God to help these people understand that he was God and to get him get them to accept him. And so one of the first things you read in the book of Daniel is where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in the dream God shows him all the nations And all that took place, and Daniel, as he interprets that dream, tells Nebuchadnezzar all that's going to happen. And when we come to the end of the dream, it says that Nebuchadnezzar said, Oh, there's no God like Daniel's God. But you don't hear any part on Nebuchadnezzar saying that he accepts Daniel's God. Just said there's no God like Daniel's God. Well, you find that... Not too long after this, that Nebuchadnezzar sets up this image out on the plains of Dura and decides that he's going to have the people come and worship it. They came there, and he told them that when they heard the sound of music, they were all to bow down and worship it. And they all did except three Hebrew young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they refused, and you remember the story, because they would not bow to it, Nebuchadnezzar had them thrown into the fiery furnace, and instead of burning them up, it just burned the ropes off of them, and there they were walking around in the furnace, and says one other person was walking around with them, like unto the Son of God. And when Nebuchadnezzar got through with that, he said, there is no God like these. And you hear all the praise that he had for the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar continues to worship the sun. No, no change here as they continue over and over. We come on down. And God gets very personal with Nebuchadnezzar. And he talks to him very, very seriously. He has this to say to him. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I mean, things were nice in Babylon, folks. They were flourishing. I mean, it was good. Okay? 
And I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the vision on my head troubled me. These were the visions of my head while on my bed I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. I want you to listen to this. Here's this tree. Height of it is great. Listen. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Huge tree. Its leaves were lovely and the fruit abundant, and in it was food for how much? All. I mean, this is describing how that all that could see it were fed. Okay? The beast of the field found shelter under it, The birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh fed from it. I mean, Babylon at this time, folks, is flourishing, and the people are cared for and fed and all, and so this is a real problem. It's a problem, particularly for the Jewish people, because when God called them out of Babylon, Things were nice in Babylon, not nice at Jerusalem. Okay? Here, so they're, they're being fed. Watch. And I saw in the vision of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. Listen. I saw the vision of my head. While on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said this, Chop down the tree, cut off the branches, strip off the leaves, scatter the fruit, let the beast get out from under it, and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, and in in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beast on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. said, take him, give him the heart of a beast. Let him eat grass with the cattle. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar could not comprehend what was going on here. Could not understand it. And finally, after the wise men were not able to tell him, he called in Daniel. And Daniel told him what it meant. This is Daniel's words to him. This is the interpretation of... Uh, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my, my Lord the king. He said, this is what's happening. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like an oxen. Terrible. Make you eat grass like an oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you till you what? Till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whoever he chooses. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, this is what's going to happen to you until you wake up, until you realize that God is the one that rules in the affairs of man. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. Said king, change, repent, change your ways. Don't continue going the way you are. Well, sadly to say, folks, 
So often when we're shaken, we feel that we must do something. We've got to change. We need to make a change. But give us a month or two, and we're right back in the same old rut. When the catastrophe took place in New York, and it shook the whole nation, I will never forget the advice that was given. After a few weeks, they said, well, go back to like you were before. No, that isn't what we needed to do. That isn't what we need to do. But that's what we do all too often. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Shaken to the very core. But a few months passes, and he's back to exactly where he was. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. Here he is walking about the royal palace of Babylon. And the king spoke, saying, Is not this, what? Great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by the might and power and the honor of my majesty. Said, Isn't this great Babylon? Listen to those words, folks, because they're repeated in Revelation. Is not this the great Babylon that I have built? All that I've set up here. And while the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, and the kingdom has departed from you. Left him. That very day, it left him. And that very day, his heart was changed to that of a beast. And he began to eat grass like an oxen. Seven years. Seven years. Until he woke up. And there you find the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar took place. But unfortunately... It didn't convert the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon continued to worship the sun. Didn't change that city. They were still opposed to God. And thus, here in this chapter, fourth chapter of Daniel, you have the fall of Babylon. The destruction of Babylon doesn't take place until the fifth chapter. And in the fifth chapter, it says, this is the interpretation of each word. Many. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tickle, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That very night, Babylon was destroyed. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So here in the fourth chapter of Daniel, you have the fall of Babylon. In the fifth chapter, you have the destruction of Babylon. So when you get to the book of Revelation... And you're studying the book of Revelation, and you get here to the 14th chapter, you have the fall of Babylon. That's what we're looking at. The destruction of Babylon does not take place until the 18th chapter. So you need to understand when we're talking about the fall, and in the fall of Babylon, God gave the people an opportunity to what? To repent, change their ways. He had pled with them. He had given them ample evidence over and over and over again of his power and his might and his greatness. And they had seen that, but they refused to accept it. And it wasn't until you get to the years, several years later, 
that you have the destruction of Babylon. Okay. I saw another angel flying, following, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Please notice that this message that this angel is proclaiming to all of them, he's not saying Babylon is going to fall. He says Babylon is fallen. It's already happened. This is not a case of something saying, well, you know, maybe she'll turn, maybe she'll change, maybe this will take place. No, that's not the case here. She has fallen. But you must understand when it says that Babylon has fallen, that means that she has fallen in the eyes of man. I'm mean, Excuse me, in the eyes of God she has fallen, not in the eyes of man. Babylon has fallen in the eyes of God, but she has not fallen in the eyes of man because you find that she leads them contrary to God very much in a different way after this. So it's important that we understand this when he's talking about who is Babylon. And I would say to you tonight, folks, very, very important that you establish who Babylon is, because that begins you, helps you see the whole picture as we take a look at it. It says here in Revelation 13, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, there's many people down through the years that have taken and said that Babylon was papal Rome. But no, Babylon is not papal Rome because the beast that came out of the sea, God has assigned as papal Rome. He said she is papal Rome. So God has assigned that to this beast from the sea. He talks about papal Rome and its rise. So when we're talking about this beast here of the sea, it describes that as papal Rome. And we gave you seven points of identification the other night so you can know exactly who that was. All right. Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, Therefore, this power must be a worldwide power because it says she has made all nations drink. So you can't, you can't take Babylon and assign it to some little part uh, of a power or something somewhere. It's got to refer to something that has influence over the whole world. That has to be that. Okay. And all the world marveled, followed the beast. Without question, folks, the papal power has had worldwide power, and the world has followed her. But you must understand that when the Bible talks about beast, it's talking about a political, secular power. Okay? Okay? And so when we're talking about uh, papal uh, Rome, it refers to it as the beast. That is talking about a political power. And by the way, papal Rome is a political power. You have to understand that. So she's a political power, and that's what it's referring to. It talks about the false prophet, and which we found out the other night the scripture identifies as the United States, which when you take a look at it, it is a political, secular power. It talks about the dragon, which the dragon represented pagan Rome, and you're going to see the influence of pagan Rome on it here as we take a look. These are the things that are involved here, and you need to understand how they all fit together as we take a look at it. 
And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. So we've got these three that make up a trinity, if you please, that goes contrary to the Word of God. They are opposed to God's Word. They are opposed to God's people. And this is what they set out to do. For they are the spirit of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So it speaks of these three. These three are the political backbone of this union. Now, I hope you understand, churches do not have power. Do you understand that? Churches do not have political power. They are churches. They are organizations. Any time in history that you have read about a particular church persecuting this type of thing, you will find that she always uses a political power to do that. She always uses a political power. She cannot of herself do that. So this is the reason you need a political power here involved in this, and it's very important that you and I understand that as we take a look at it. It talks about the false prophet and the beast. The beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So you have the beast, you have the false prophet, and you have the dragon, those three. Watch, uh, if you've got your Bible, turn with me over to the, uh, the 16th chapter, I think is what I want. 16th chapter of Revelation. Yes, verse 19. Revelation 16, verse 19. Listen to what it says. And the great city was divided into three parts. See? The great city was divided into three parts. And the city of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine and the fierceness of her wrath. So here it's talking about Babylon being divided into three parts. And those three parts that we have just looked at is that of papal Rome, the false prophet, and the dragon. And you're going to see in just a little bit how that all comes together and fits together and works. Because this is a confederacy, folks. This is a confederacy of false belief. That's what you have here that makes up Babylon, a confederacy of false belief. And so it's divided into three parts. And because she has what? Made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her, in her fornication. You see, made means enforcement. I'm going to make people do that. And in order to make somebody do that, you have to have you have to have the arm of the state to do that you've got to be able to enforce it and so she's going to make the people drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication very very important now the dragon the false prophet and the beast so how does that become a confederacy of false belief simply this way out of the dragon you have paganism okay out of the false prophet you have protestantism 
and out of the papal Rome, you have Catholicism. Those are the three. We're talking now about belief. You see, this is what is there. So this is a union of taking all three of those things and putting them together. And this is what the Scripture refers to as Babylon. Babel. You know what that meant? Confusion. In other words, it's taking these three beliefs and trying to bring them all together, and God refers to that as Babylon. And this is what we're looking at here, these three that have been put together. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. You see, it's the enforcement of this that brings about what the Scripture refers to as the mark of the beast. Because it's taking these three, putting them together, and out of that enforcing, making the world follow it, and this brings about the enforcement of what the Scripture refers to as the mark of the beast. So when we say, who is Babylon? Babylon is a system of false belief made up of paganism, Protestantism, and Catholicism. That's what it's made of. And in the last days, it says that is going to figure into the overall scheme in a very, very definite way. And by the way, put it down. When we read about the fall of Babylon, I mean the collapse of Babylon, uh, Babylon was doing very, very well. I don't know if you're catching what I'm trying to tell you, but the Scripture pictures that she is doing well. She falls in the eyes of God, but not in the eyes of man. And so she is doing well, Financially, things are going very good until she collapses. When she collapses, then it doesn't go well at all. But until then, yes, she's doing well. So you can see as you watch, and you watch the things that are taking place, you're going to see this whole process take place. But it's the false beliefs that we need to follow with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made what? Drunk with the wine of her fornication. Hmm. Made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Let me ask you something. Can you reason with a drunk man? No. You can't reason with a drunk it's impossible. I can remember when I was young, just starting in the ministry, we were going to hold a meeting in a place called Raton, New Mexico. And in this little town where I lived, we had a drunk. He was there, uh, you know, everybody knew him. We all called him Moose. That's what we called him. And, uh, and he had showed up at the church a time or two uh, wanting help, and we had given him some help from time to time, but uh, he, I can remember, showed up at the church talking to us, and so we decided that we were going to really do something for Moose and try to get him to change his way and his life and all, you know, and so, uh, so we went up to Raton, New Mexico, and we were pitching a tent to prepare for the meeting and get all things ready. And Moose was helping us, and he worked there with us and helped us and all. And being young and not understanding some basic things that I probably needed to understand, uh, since he had worked for us and helped us there, I decided that I should pay him. Okay. Bad decision, folks. <laughs> 
But anyhow, I paid Moose for helping us there. Well, he took the money and went out and got drunk, you know, and all. Well, that night he came to the meeting. And not too unusual for me to have somebody drunk come to the meeting, but uh, anyhow, he came to the meeting. But here I was up there preaching, and right during the sermon, he got up and come walking down the aisle there yelling, Eve came from an apple. Eve came from an apple. You know, and uh, I just finally looked at him and said, Moose, sit down and be quiet. And so he did and didn't say any more. But, uh, but you can't reason with a drunk, folks. And these people are drunk with the wine of the wrath of this woman. They're drunk with these beliefs. And so the question of reason or getting them to understand the Word of God is almost out of question. They can't understand because they're drunk with the wine of this woman. This is where they are. And this is what it's talking about, what it's referring to. So you have paganism, and you have Protestantism, and you have Catholicism. Now, if you've got those three beliefs, religious beliefs, and they're all going to be coming together. What do they have in common? What do they have in common? What do they believe that they could unite together and form a system of false belief? Well, they all have Sunday worship. They all have Sunday worship. Came from Babylon, paganism. That's where it came from, folks. Their worship of the sun god. They went out and worshiped the sun. And so it was handed, handed to Catholicism. And Catholicism took the belief of Sunday as a day of worship and bequeathed it to Protestantism as a sacred legacy. And so today, you have those three all believing in worship on Sunday. This is one point they can unite on. Another thing they believed was the immortality of the soul. And again, comes directly from paganism. Greek mythology that taught that the body was the prison house of the soul. And when a person died, the soul was set free. In fact, that's even where they got Spartan soldiers, folks. When a baby boy was born, they took him, put him, on a, lay, took him up on top of a mountain, laid him on a shield, and went off and left him for... 24 hours, and if he survived, he became a part Spartan soldier. This was part of their belief. This, again, was given to Catholicism, and Catholicism handed it to Protestantism, and so all of them hold the immortality of the soul, the natural immortality of the soul, as a belief. And so these are points that they can unite on and come together and say, this is what we believe. And the Scripture says that as they unite, this will be looked upon as something that will bless them and cause them to prosper, and thus they place their blessing and enforce certain beliefs. Now, let me tell you something. What do you have to do when it comes to belief to be able to enforce it? Do you know? Well, yeah, you have to have law, but if I believe in something that I accept in my mind, you don't know whether I believe that or not. That's just between me and the Lord. But when I believe in something that changes lifestyle, you can enforce that. You follow me? And so this is what it's talking about, enforcement of it. And on our forehead, 
A name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth. You see, this is Babylon. Those that follow her beliefs, the Scripture classifies as her daughters. This is where we are, where we stand. And so here, you find that as we get into Scripture, God gives an invitation. It says here, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. You see, Babylon has fallen, but God says there's people in Babylon that are his people that he is calling out, calling them to come out of her, not to be part of it, not to receive of her sins and what she's done. And so you and I must be faithful to God's word. We must stand solidly upon the word of God and make sure that what we believe is where we stand and not be willing to be swayed by the conditions and the things that are taking place. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask tonight that we might make sure that our hearts are surrendered to God, that we follow Him, that we stay true to Your Word, that we don't permit the things of this world to attract us, even though it may be nice in Babylon, Lord, and it may be rough outside, help us to trust you, be willing to stand with you, and to follow you. Bless each one, we pray, in your name. Amen. Well, tomorrow... We'll be going into the third angel's message, uh, something that is very, very much involved in what we talked about tonight. All three of these angel's messages are together, and so we have to understand what he's talking about. So be sure and join us. Good night. God bless you. All around us, we see want and suffering. In large cities, millions of human beings do not receive as much care and consideration as we give beasts to the field. Families are herded together in miserable projects. Children are born into these terrible places. They see nothing of the beauty God has created to delight their senses. They're left to grow up molded and fattened by wretched and wicked examples all around them. They hear the name of God only in profanity, impure words and fumes of liquor and tobacco and immoral behavior of every kind pervert their tender senses. Wretched and pitiful cries for food and clothing are heard by parents who know nothing about prayer or loving Savior. But these cries do not go unheard in heaven. God sees, God hears. Friends, our loving Father has entrusted us with abundance to supply the necessities of all. But sadly, we're not always faithful stewards. Many who have taken on the name of Christ spend his money for selfish pleasure, extravagant homes and clothing. They hardly give a suffering human a look of pity or a word of sympathy. We are to show the kindness of the Samaritan in food, clothing, and shelter for the poor. As Christians, our work is to reach the people who are neglected and win them to Christ. That's the goal of this ministry. We want them to know that He is able to save to the uttermost and restore them to His image. But in order to do this, we need your help. Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 
747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the series The Three Angels' Messages may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series including Beast from the Sea, United States, First Angel's Message, Second Angel's Message, Third Angel's Message, Second Coming of Christ, and The Seven Last Plagues may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.